Hi everyone, welcome to May's edition of Cyber. Um, as I'm sure you are all very aware, we are still in the COVID-19 crisis, so we're having to bring Cybar to you virtually once again for a second time. And even though it is frustrating that we can't do this in person, there, there is some slight silver linings. So we did a virtual Cybar for the first time last month, um, and it was recorded. And because of that, um, we now have our very own Palace of Science YouTube channel. Um, so if you missed last month's event and you would like to see it, you can head over to YouTube. We had an excellent talk by Dr. David Cushing. Um, he talked to us about the mathematics of magic. Um, so if you want to learn some card tricks and understand the maths that makes them work, then you can go to YouTube and check that out. Um, hopefully, assuming there's no technical issues this evening, um, tonight's talk will be recorded as well and it will be added to YouTube so you can watch it again and again if you wish. Um, one of the um, other advantages of this, because we're having to do this online, it now means that sort of travel time and distance is no longer an issue, which means some people um, in our audience joining us tonight are from further afield. Um, so welcome, thank you for coming along. Um, and if you've not been to one of our events before, I'll say first off, hi, I'm Nicola. I'm one of the event organizers for Palace of Science. And if you're not familiar with who we are, we are a not-for-profit organization based in Newcastle in the northeast of England. And we host a series of um, events just like this one, but usually in person, to showcase the science and research that's happening in the northeast. Um, so it's run by volunteers. We all volunteer to bring these events um, to you, specifically to the public. So to enjoy our events, you don't need any specialized background, any um, specialized knowledge or anything. We just hope that um, we can bring you events that you'll find interesting, perhaps learn something that you didn't know before, um, and importantly, learn a bit about the huge diversity of science and research that's happening in the Northeast as well. So that's um, who we are and what we do. So if anyone did join us for the event last month, you will notice we're using a slightly different platform. Um, we've gone to Twitch this time. Um, this was actually recommended by one of our friends over at Skeptics in the Pub, um, David. I think he's watching. Hi, David. Um, and also, if anything goes wrong, that is very much his fault. So it's good we have someone to blame for that. Um, the idea of switching to this platform was so that you guys in the audience can have um, a bit more interaction with each other. Obviously, it's very different they're very difficult to get sort of the social interaction that we normally have at the um, in-person events. But you'll see that there is um, a chat box down to your right. You can post comments or questions in that box throughout the event. I will just point out, in order to post any questions, you do need a Twitch account. So you can sign up to that if you just click the sign up button in the top right hand corner. Um, it's really easy, it's free. You just need to create a username and password, and then you can post all the questions you like um, that I can ask the speaker a bit later on. So, um, before we get started, I'll just give a quick run through of how this is going to work. So, the talk this evening should last about half an hour, and then we're going to take a five minute break. So, during this five minute break and throughout the talk as well, um, if you have any questions about the talk or comments, you can post that to the chat box once you've signed up to Twitch, as I mentioned. Um, and also during that break, it's important that you uh, refresh your glasses. We um, think of that very highly here at Palace of Science. Normally when we hold these events in person, we do so at a venue that has a very well stocked bar. Um, so hopefully you all have access to the beverages of your choice, wherever you are at the moment. Um, after that five minute break, we will come back for a question and answer session. For any questions that you have posted, I will then ask um, the speaker to answer them. So um, tonight's talk, um, that's what you're all here for. I will shut up in a moment. Um, tonight's talk, it's very timely, actually. So when I originally asked Vicky to give a talk for Cybar, 
it was it seems like years ago now it's quite a while ago um i didn't realize at the time that it did coincide with mental health awareness week um i also didn't realize that it would coincide with a global pandemic in which we'd all be locked inside probably dreaming of the green spaces we no longer have access to um so it's quite fitting for the moment so obviously we've been in lockdown now for nearly two months here in the uk and understandably that is likely to have affected most if not all of us um, in a negative way in terms of our mental health um, that's what mental health awareness week is all about to make people um, aware of this to make people know that identifying a problem with your mental health is important um, you're not alone and it's really important also to know that there's loads of resources out there um, for you if you do identify a problem. So you will have noticed in our holding slides, we actually shared the link to the Mental Health Awareness um, Week page. So if you want any more information, that's a great place to start. So um, tonight's talk is going to touch on that issue, uh, but it's going to do so from a geography perspective, which I think is probably one not many people have considered before, uh, myself included in that. So our speaker tonight um, is a research associate at Newcastle University. Um, she um, is based in the Centre of Urban and Regional Development Studies, or CURDS, which I think is an acronym we can all really appreciate. Um, and she's going to talk to us tonight about some of the research she did for her, her PhD um, that she's also continued into her postdoc as well. So I'm going to hand over now to our speaker, which is Dr. Vicky Holden. Take it away. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, thanks very much, Nicola, for the introduction. Um, as you said, I'm Vicky Holden and I'm a researcher at Newcastle University. Um, I have a background in urban science. And I'm really interested in healthy urban environments and in particular how we can bring greenery into cities to benefit our health and well-being. And in particular, partly because we're in a global pandemic and partly because it's Mental Health Awareness Week, I'm also going to talk about ways that we can make the most of our interactions with nature to benefit our mental well-being. So we're all affected by mental health because we all have mental health, even if it's not something we really like to talk about. Whenever anyone asks us if we're okay or how we're doing, we always say, I'm fine, without really giving it much second thought. We only really tend to address our mental health when problems arise and then we have to deal with them. But just as with physical health, just because we're not ill, that doesn't make us well. And mental well-being is a concept of positive mental health from which everyone can benefit. And just as there's ways that we know we can support our physical health, like we all know we should try and not smoke or drink too much, get enough sleep, do a little bit of exercise and eat a few more vegetables, there's things we can do to support our mental well-being as well. So things like changes to our lifestyle, our environment and how we interact with it. But this becomes challenging when we think about how much our environments have changed over recent years. Half the world's population now lives in cities and in England it's actually over 80%. And this is people moving into the cities for jobs and opportunities and employment. But cities can also be noisy, hectic, stressful, polluted, and pretty overwhelming. So actually, mental health and well-being tends to be poorer in urban areas. And this is a problem because we've got more and more people living in a smaller and smaller space, which isn't necessarily any good for us. But one thing we do know benefits us is nature. I think we all noticed at the moment we're really enjoying where we can go on our walks and visit our local park. And by bringing nature into the city, we can su support our mental health and well-being. And this is also important economically because we tend to use GDP to measure how well our um, country is doing. But GDP was um, criticised by Bobby Kennedy when it was first introduced for measuring all that except that which makes life worthwhile. And we can see that from this graph. So if you see GDP has pretty much grown year on year despite you know normal undulations. And although life satisfaction started increasing over recent years, it's really not keeping up. And we're seeing this larger gap between how we're doing economically and how we're doing um, culturally. Um, this really shows how um, doing well economically doesn't necessarily equate with happiness. 
Um, it, up to a certain point, so in developing countries, um, having higher income can equate to better well-being. But really interestingly, in the more developed nations, what we see is that it's the, the countries with the highest inequalities that have the poorer health. So we've got this um, economic inequality and this health inequality. This isn't just important to the country, it's actually something the media has started talking a lot more about in recent years. We've seen this growing interest in green space and health. Um, and we're seeing a lot of anecdotal evidence in particular that people feel happier, more relaxed, less stressed when they're in natural environments. Um, and I think um, particularly we saw last weekend, the second we were allowed a little bit more freedom, people rushed to the coast to local, local nature spots and they really just needed to get out and see some nature. And this is also a really cultural issue because um, we have expressions that we use all the time, like escape to the country or getting out of the city. Although we have actually at the moment got limited on evidence um, on exactly how and why green space should be structured and maintained to best benefit our mental well-being. Partly because a lot of people don't necessarily understand exactly the nuance of mental well-being. Like I said, we tend to talk about mental illness and assume that applies to mental health as well. So a lot of research in um, urban planning tends to focus on areas where there's more or less mental illness. And they say that when we've got less illness, we've got more health. But it's not actually strictly um, a um, sliding scale like that. It's more of a spectrum. And when the World Health Organization um, first included their definition of health in 1948, they emphasized that it really was more than this absence of disease, a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. So mental health is in there, mental well-being is in there, but it's only something we started thinking about um, relatively recently. And we have two main aspects. So we have how we feel, which is known as hedonic well-being, and how we function, known as eudaimonic well-being. So our hedonic well-being is things like our life satisfaction, like we've just seen, um, how we're feeling day to day, our quality of life, how happy we're feeling, not feeling too anxious, things like that. Our eudaimonic well-being is more to do with our self-esteem, our sense of fulfillment, our sense of purpose in our life. And one anecdote I think works quite well to explain this is um, the idea of uh, job satisfaction. So if you go to work, it pays the bills, you get on with your colleagues, you come home at the end of the day, it's fine. I mean, it might make you happy day to day, but it's not necessarily going to be good for your eudaimonic well-being unless you feel like you've um, got a sense to a chance to prove yourself and you've got um, opportunities to progress or like you're making a difference in whatever way matters to you. So you can see how hedonic and eudaimonic well-being, they're overlapping and they're similar, but they are two dimensions that it's really important to consider. And that's something a lot of people haven't really looked at in terms of the environment until relatively recently, which is why I did my PhD in it. Um, and um, for an individual, we might see um, that our well-being changes over time. We've got our baseline, which is um, where we start really. And our mental well-being will oscillate around this baseline over time. And that's really normal. And we have a normal range, which is where our well-being tends to stay most of the time. But a very positive or a very negative event might take us outside of our normal range for a short time. But it tends to go back to closer to that baseline eventually, um, which is good news. Uh, but so what we might see is that um, that peak on the left might be something like um, the start of the year, maybe all like Christmas. So everyone's feeling pretty well and pretty happy, spending more time with your family, um, eating loads of good food, things are pretty good. And then the year starts, January starts, everything starts to dip. But then you get into the swing of things and things go back up again. And then there's something happens like a unprecedented, enormous global pandemic and your mental well-being dips out of its normal range. So these oscillations are really, really normal. Um, and um, in fact, if your well-being stayed the same all the time, that would be more worrying than it changing. What, what we can do is look at lifestyle or environment interventions to increase our baseline and make, raise normal range so that people can become happier. At the highest levels, people are known as flourishing. And this is really important because the more people we have at these higher levels, um, the better we do as a country in terms of longevity, productivity and prosperity, which are all really important things uh, for a society. And there's different things we can do um, to improve our well-being. Unfortunately, about 50 percent of it is our set point. So that's our starting baseline, really. That's genetic. There's nothing really you can really do about that. About 10 percent is our circumstances. 
that's our past, our education, our ethnicity and our experiences, as well as things like health and income. But luckily, around 40% of our mental well-being is thought to be down to choices. So that things like um, intentional activities, our lifestyle, things we can do to improve our well-being. And um, this is, you know, obviously it's not just important economically. Everyone wants to feel well. Everyone wants to be able to do well. Everyone wants to be able to deal with normal stress. So the thing about people with better mental well-being is it's not that you don't get stressed. It's just that you're better at dealing with everyday normal stresses, um, which is it. The NHS offers some um, guidance, which you may have seen before. This is called the five ways to well-being. And these are five different aspects we can consider to improve our mental well-being. The first is give, it's altruism, it's volunteering, giving to charity, helping other people. And that sort of ties in with our eudaimonic well-being because that can give you a sense of purpose. It can make you feel a sense of worth and like you're contributing and making a difference. So, and keeping and learning is next. And that doesn't have to be, you know, continue, continuing doing degrees or going to school or online courses. That can be whatever, that can be, you know, keeping learning as in, you know, getting better at yoga or cooking or, um, whatever it is that makes a difference to you, whatever is interesting to you. Um, active, we all know, is really important for our physical and our mental health, um, but it's often overlooked in terms of its um, in mental well-being benefits. Connecting, so that's connecting to other people and the world around you. And finally, taking notice. And this is one aspect I'm going to focus on quite a lot today, because this can be taking notice of your environment, taking a pause, looking at what's around you, absorbing your environment, and that can really help you feel connected to other people, to the wider world, and benefit your mental health. Unfortunately, when it comes to green space planning, there's a lot less guidance. <laughs> Actually, there's currently no statutory planning policy for green space in the UK at all, which is quite surprising. What we have got is the United Nations and this was introduced in 2015, all the member states of the UN decided to try and tackle the different aspects of um, sustainable development. So that's urbanization, climate change, globalization, by signing up to these 17 different missions. And some of them tie in really well with what we're talking about today. So number three is good health and well-being. Number 10 is reducing inequalities. And that ties in again with our trying to create a more equal society that will be healthier. And number 11, sustainable cities and communities. And specifically, Goal 11.7 focuses on access to green and public spaces, in particular for women, children, older persons, and persons with disabilities. So it's really interesting that they're focusing on more marginalized communities who may potentially spend more time closer to home and are able to benefit from their local green space um, more fully. What we do have as well is these ANCS Accessible Natural Green Space Guidelines, but these were introduced in 2010 um, and they've now been archived. They're not enforced at all. But interesting, they do suggest that we should have different amounts of green space within different distances from our home. The idea being that your people are willing to travel further to visit larger green spaces. So part of my research in my PhD was to investigate these different um, guidelines um, and see whether they made sense for mental well-being because they're based on um, consideration of normal walking patterns and family surveys rather than any robust research into green space and mental well-being. So this is really what I found in my research is that there's different ways of conceptualizing green space and different aspects of green space that are important. So the idea being that on the left we've got green space, in the middle we've got these different characteristics of green space which we might benefit from, on the right this benefits our mental well-being. So the amount of green space what we found is that um, having more green space nearby is really important, but it doesn't just have to be usable green space. It doesn't just have to be parks and nature reserves and places you can walk around. It can also be things like trees along the street or grass verges. People tend to feel better when they live in a generally greener environment. Next, we have types of green space. So we looked at all the main different types of green space, which were sports facilities, formal parks and gardens, and nature reserves, or natural green spaces, which include nature reserves and woodland. And we found that natural green spaces were the most beneficial. They were the most strongly associated with mental well-being. So that's not to say that having um, non less natural green space nearby isn't important. It's just that we may get the most benefits 
from natural green spaces. Although having options is really important because you can't necessarily go and kick a football around in a nature reserve, but you might be in a local park or football pitch. So having options is really important as well. Viewing green space can be really important. That can be, you know, standing on top of a mountain and taking in the view, or that can be looking at the trees outside your front window. Both of those are really important, um, particularly at the moment. Um, and studies of older people in particular have shown that they feel less isolated, less lonely when they can see trees from their living room because it helps them feel more connected to the outside world. And it gives you something. Visiting green space is obviously really important. And a study um, that was published last summer showed that two hours in green space was the most important for mental health. It didn't matter whether you went for a big long walk of two hours at the weekend or whether you went for 20 minutes a few times a week. Two hours seemed to be the ideal dose. Going less than this was still um, important, but not as good as going for two hours. Um, going any more than two hours um, didn't really make much difference. Accessibility is can be physical accessibility or social accessibility. So are the social barriers that stop people benefiting? Um, or do they have good footpaths within the park? Do they have ramps instead of stairs? What's the footpath like? But it can also be how far we have to travel to green space. And what I found in my research is that having green space within 300 meters is the most important for mental wellbeing. So green space further away than 300 meters still helps, but 300 meters seems to be this really important number that which is about five, five minutes walk from our homes. Having some green space within five minutes walk from our home seems to be really important. And finally, connection. Environments that help you connect with nature, that help you feel connected to this wider world can be really important for benefiting our mental wellbeing. So that's everything from a sort of green space planning point of view. But you're probably thinking, well, that's all very well, but I'm not an urban planner. I can't change the amount of green space in the neighbourhood that I live in. But fortunately, there's a lot of things you can do to improve your interactions with nature to help you benefit from your, your exposure to green environments. And I'm going to talk through those now. The first one is this concept of biophilia. And this is meaning bio, nature, philia, love. And it really means we have this innate desire to connect with other forms of life. So. The theory is that as we evolved in natural landscapes, they're where we still feel most at home, they still feel um, most relaxed, most inspired, most comfortable. So it's why we tend to gravitate towards green spaces on our um, on our daily world. It's why when we see a rainbow, we have to point and say, oh, rainbow, because we like noticing the world around us. We like noticing nature and we find it really beneficial. So by feeding into that, by um, following where you want to go on your walk, going into the woods can be really beneficial and help you connect. The next is um, recovery and restoration. So there's two theories, one focusing on um, attention restoration and the other on stress recovery. So attention restoration is the idea that we have a finite amount of directed attention. There's only so long we can concentrate on a certain activity. But we also have this idea of fascination. So certain environments tend to capture our attention. So when we're walking in a beautiful environment, we don't have to concentrate on looking at it. We just walk through and enjoy it. Whereas even no matter how, how interesting we find our work, we tend to run out of steam after a little while. So by going into a natural environment, we can rest our attention and feel more restored. Stress recovery is really important. And that's the idea that nature has all these qualities that enable us to feel less stressed and um, more relaxed. So by going into green space, it can help you feel a lot more relaxed. Next one is socialising. And this is more about how specifically using the green space. So green spaces offer a place for socialising. If we live in a greener environment, we're more likely to walk around it. It's more attractive. It's a more pleasant place to be. But walking in a park, we're more likely to see other people and acknowledge them, smile, nod at them, maybe stop and say hello or they can be used for group activities, holding events, all this kind of thing. And being social, having a really good social network is really, really important for our mental health and wellbeing. Physical activity, as we've said, is really important. And we're also seeing more and more research coming out about the benefits of physical activity for our mental health. And particularly in a society that's increasingly obsessed with appearances, I think it's really important to focus on the fact that men, that our mental health can be boosted by physical activity um, and kind of focusing on how it makes you feel rather than how it makes you look. And there's some really interesting studies recently showing um, 
the just the power of exercise for our mental health. So people who exercise more in their youth have fewer risk factors for dementia in later life. So the more you keep active, the less likely you are to experience things like dementia in later life. It doesn't mean you're not going to experience that, but it just makes it a, a lot less likely. It reduces those risk factors. And um, finally, connecting with nature. Um, this is kind of tapping again into that biophilia, but anything that enables you to connect with nature in whatever way is meaningful for you. So maybe that's gardening, maybe that's doing yoga naked in a park, although I probably wouldn't recommend that particularly, especially at the moment. Um, but whatever it is that helps you connect, maybe it's um, watching the sunset, maybe that's going for walks in somewhere that means something to you. But enabling yourself to connect with nature, whether that's breathing, breathing in the smells, whether that's li listening to the birds, whether that's kind of picking up leaves, uh, blowing a what they, dandelion, you know, whatever it is that helps you connect can be really, really beneficial. But like most of you, I'm also pretty stuck inside at the moment. I know we're now allowed to go out a little bit more now, but um, there are certain things we can do to bring nature inside and help us connect with it in times when we're not able to get out and about quite as much. So firstly, looking outside pretty straightforward but it's something we forget to do but it's something we often do subconsciously so I don't know about you but when I'm at work or maybe in a not particularly exciting meeting and there's a window nearby you find your attention gazing out of the window and looking at the trees outside or whatever it is we tend to do this automatically without really thinking about it but it's something we can try and do a bit more consciously or listening to the outside as well. So opening your windows, maybe there's a tree outside and you can look at how it looks different in different lights or, or maybe you can see how the flowers open at a certain time of day. Maybe you can listen to the wind and the rain at certain times and just help you feel a little bit more connected while you're inside. You can also plants bring plants inside. Um, things like herbs and cress are really, really good um, for windowsills. If you're lucky enough to have some outside space, maybe you can put some flowers in your garden or some pots. Um, they sell them in all the supermarkets. They seem to be doing really well out of them at the moment. So it's pretty um, accessible to most people. Um, or, you know, buying houseplants and things like that if you're any good at keeping them alive, which I, for someone who has a PhD in green space, I'm spectacularly good at killing all, ha all houseplants. Um, other ways you can bring nature indoors if you're have a tendency for murdering plants, um, is things like rocks, shells, pine cones, um, potpourri, things like that, that can bring um, elements of nature into your surroundings. But it can also be things like images of nature, so putting pictures of nature on your walls can just help you get that little dose of nature and look at something um, a little bit outside the walls of your house. But you can also try and take a little bit more notice, for example, when you're cooking, try and like savour the flavours and think about where these plants came from as you cook them. Maybe sip your coffee a little bit more slowly and just think about it and kind of immerse yourself into it and kind of feel a bit more connected to the moment. Um, changing your background on your phone, your laptop, your iPad, or if you've got one of those fancy TV TVs that you can turn into an art gallery, whatever it is, changing your background might just help you um, feel a little bit more refreshed and kind of remind you that there's a world outside your laptop or whatever it is, and it might just help a little bit. Or something that means something to you, a particular place you've been on holiday or a view you saw that, you, that really meant something to you, then that can be a really good way of doing that too. Also watching any nature documentary, um, anything that appeals to you probably i mean i'm not sure tiger king counts as a nature documentary but anything that helps you um see nature or maybe films that feature a lot of nature as well and um, anything that sort of um enables you to see nature from the comfort of your sofa um but um there are other things you can do beyond just connecting with nature particularly as it's mental health awareness week i just want you to talk about this a little bit so the first thing is you don't have to make sourdough or banana bread or anything. You don't have to do what everyone else seems to be doing on Instagram. You know, we've all seen Karen on Facebook who's running a marathon every day, cooking a gourmet dinner for her three children, you know, is constantly volunteering, looking after her family and doing a lifestyle blog about it while having a full-time job and two dogs. You know, there's always going to be someone who's been doing more and trying not to compare to that and doing things that make you feel good is really, really important. I should go without saying, but I think it's pretty easy to kind of get stuck in that Instagram vortex. You can choose your news. You don't have to keep up with the news all the time. Obviously, it's important to know what's going on more generally, but maybe if it's feeling overwhelming, you can just not 
watch the news or read the news, but keep on BBC notifications. So if something major happens, like a lockdown starts or ends, or schools open or don't, then you'll know about it. If something major happens, you'll know about it. Or maybe you can just watch a briefing in the evening to get all the main information, but not read about it during the day. Maybe there's certain blogs or news websites that say things in a way that is more absorbable for you. Kind of going along with that is stay connected. So connect with other people. I know we're all a little bit zoomed out after a million and one family Zoom pub quizzes, but staying connected to our friends and family is really, really important. Checking in with people, letting them check in with you, reminding yourself that there are people out there and you will be able to see them eventually and give them a huge hug is really important. Trying to be present as well and notice that, you know, this won't go on forever, but actually there's not a lot most of us can do about it at the moment. So trying to just, you know, sip that coffee, watch that sunset, try and focus on the here and now and try not to get caught up in that train of thought that runs away with you and worries about everything that might or might not happen in the future. And practicing gratitude can help you really focus on the now and what you actually have got. Some people swear by writing three things that they're grateful for down before bed, or some people just try and note when something good did happen, be like, oh, actually, you know, that, I, I don't know, they, the avocados I bought in Tesco were actually really right, you know, whatever it is. And moving for your physical and mental health, we have focused on that a, a lot earlier in the presentation, but also it doesn't have to be going for a run. It doesn't have to be designated exercise. It can be whatever makes you feel good, whether that's trying to stretch every couple of hours when you're stuck in front of your laptop. Maybe it is running a marathon. Maybe it's just, you know, doing you know, Joe Wicks PE, because you want to stay at Joe Wicks, whatever, um, makes you feel good and can really, really benefit your physical and mental health. And not trying to, you know, stick to a program if you don't want to, just trying to get a little bit moving, even if it's just going for a 10 minute walk in the morning. Um, eating good food, really, really important. Um, and making sure you're not just trying to eat healthy food, making sure, making sure you're eating food that you actually enjoy, you know, um, if you can't get flour like no one seems to be able to get at the moment and you know to go and buy those cookies and enjoy them because it's they're going to taste great and they'll probably make you feel better you know emotional eating is a really valid form of self-care and finally maybe this one's a bit more specific to my experience but read Harry Potter again or watch I don't know all the Avengers films or have a bath or I don't know subscribe to an expensive houseplant service that you don't really need whatever it is that is your comfort blanket whatever it is that really makes you feel better especially if it's something that kind of digs into things that comforted you when you were younger so that's why I reread Harry Potter again and again but whatever it is that enables you to um, feel a little bit more safe and settled whatever it is that helps support your mental health then you should do it and also remember that it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling I think there's no normal response to this um, and I've also heard people saying they're feeling a bit guilty because they're kind of okay and they feel like they should be more worried than they are whatever it is it's being cycles that are mental health changes all the time and you'll probably feel differently tomorrow than you did today and you probably feel differently today than you did yesterday it's a bit of a i heard it described as a corona coaster of emotions the other day which i think is pretty apt and finally i just want to finish on this quote that i saw on twitter um, which is you're not working from home you are at your home during a crisis trying to work we're all just kind of trying to get along and I hope that this has helped you a little bit understand how you can use nature to benefit your mental health as well as some of the things you can do to try and help you kind of get through this slightly ridiculous time. And also after that, you know, you understand more about the relationship between nature and your health and how you can benefit from that. So I think that's everything. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all for posting your questions. We're going to have a question and answer session with the speaker now. So Vicky's here waiting. Okay. Um, 
Wow. Oh, hold, hold on one second. Apparently, I can't be heard. <laughs> uh, you and I can't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm back. <laughs> what, what, what you missed there was me apologising for the technical glitch. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies again. Um, so we're going to do the question and answer session now. So I was just reading out one of the questions to Vicky there. Um, I'll just repeat the question. So as a researcher, how has the lockdown situation affected you professionally? And what have you and your colleagues been able to do to boost your mental well-being as a research community? Well, thankfully, um, my research team have been absolutely fantastic. Um, I think setting out that there aren't any expectations straight away that was like try and get done what you can but obviously this is super weird so don't be too hard on yourself but it was really really helpful and um, most of my research I've been able to kind of carry on and um, as usual I'm currently in my kitchen which is my home office um, and I think it really helps for me personally that I don't have any like small humans running around and I, I think for other people that could be incredibly challenging and um, but I think yeah, a lot of my research, like I said, I've been able to carry on doing the certain projects that are on hold because I need to be in the office to do them, accessing certain types of data. And also we were just starting up some research within the Newcastle parks. So we were hoping to put some sensors in the parks that would um, record bird song and enable us to look at whether, um, like which bird species are indicative of a more tranquil or more biodiverse environment and um, to give us a picture of more detailed picture of the green spaces in Newcastle. Um, having pub pub trips with work has been really helpful um, and lots of coffee mornings. I think kept staying in touch with everyone um, and also talking about things that aren't coronavirus. Sometimes, you know, if, people, if that's all people will talk about in a coffee meeting and you just kind of need to like, you like, know, I need to just talk about, I don't know, the fact that I watched Lord of the Rings again at the weekend, you know, what, I, or, you know, I think, yeah, yeah having a break from that. Um, I but I think it's talk. really made me reflect on needing nature as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can totally relate to that. In our, um, I, I work in research as well. Um, our group, it's quite, it's enlightening, really. Um, you get to learn a lot about other people's situations, which you don't realise. And I think mm -hmm. that's really important to know other people have such drastically different situations and you have to be very understanding of that so it's great people are saying you know don't be too hard on yourself and things like that it does help um, yeah and you're totally right about not hearing about the virus as well we've um, actually got a few people in our office that started um, growing vegetables in their gardens that they've never done before oh, yeah. and um, mm -hmm. every 24 hours going out to see how far the carrots have grown and things like that and now I'm, I'm heavily invested in someone else's <laughs> carrots to be honest <laughs> <laughs> like every every time we have a meeting now, I'm like, how are you doing? Are they okay? <laughs> I'm starting to worry that because it's carrots, she's going to have to eat them. Um, and I'm not sure if any of us can handle that. <laughs> um, another question that came through um, is actually one I was thinking about. Um, so it's Callum, actually, from Palace of Science. Um, he wants to know if there is a relationship relationship between light and well-being so green space and having lots of light is that closely linked um i guess genuinely uh, generally just meaning sort of uv exposure vitamin d mm. um, yeah well, well daylight can really help with your circadian rhythm um, and keeping in a kind of vaguely normal routine at the moment particularly could be really helpful so getting daylight um can, yeah help you feel more awake um less tired obviously um more relaxed um and yeah kind of keep you in that normal pattern um and also like if you've got a, a window in the room you're in even if you're not that much to see a kind of seeing something outside can help you not feel like quite so claustrophobic as well um but yeah i don't know that there's quite as much research on that although we do know that having low vitamin d levels can make you feel like really sluggish and tired um, and obviously UV is really important for making vitamin D so yeah so that uh, that falls quite closely to a question I was going to ask so all the research that you did was that based in Newcastle and um, my research was based um, well, for all my PhD research was based at a either UK scale or in London because um, it was only in 2000 and 
17 or 18, possibly 17, that Ordnance Survey, so obviously the biggest mapping agency in the country, released a green space map of the UK. So actually, it's been pretty difficult to study. A lot of studies look at um, local areas. So how much green space is in this local area? Which if do you track any of this um thinking about the sort of climate and weather because i know certainly when i first moved to newcastle to do my degree many years ago it was actually the green space um, that sold it for me um, mm. and i think the reason i've stayed here is to do with the weather so newcastle is one of if not the driest city in the uk so certainly when you think about going and using a green space, it's much more appealing to do if it's not going to be torrential rain outside for 300 days a year. Um, <laughs> you know, if, that, if that has an impact, like if you, if you have access to green space, but it's always raining, is it, are you still likely to feel any benefit from it? Do you know? I don't know. Although, I mean, I was told this when I came for my interview at Newcastle, because before that I was at work. And um, people told me that it was very a dry city. And my experience so far has not proven that to be true. I think we, I think we just had a really rainy year last year. Um, I mean, I'm not sure. I think most studies tend to be, I mean, they take account of the location, but they don't always take account of the climate. Um, Although I do think there's something to be said for you know how good the woods smell after it's rained. But everything just smells so much nicer after it's rained. So I don't know if there's any specific research on it, but um, I think it probably goes both ways as well. Because as well, if you've got more rain, then things tend to be more lush. They're going to grow better. Um, so I think it probably probably goes both ways. But yeah, you do need weather that allows you to to enjoy the green spaces and. I think we've been really lucky actually in recent weeks that we've been able to get out and about but when we wanted for our daily walk. Yeah, I suppose that's probably a personal choice. I guess there are people out there that love the rain and probably flock to a green space in that. Um, but I'm not one of them. Um, yeah. I'm sure they're out there. <laughs> um, another question we've got, um, do you know, are there any green space benefits of people living in flats using their balconies? Yeah, so having any outside space um, is really, really helpful. Obviously, you're not going to be able to like immerse yourself in the green space the same way that you are um, if you've got like a really big garden or something like that. But you know, having a little bit of out space, outdoor space, and being able to get a bit of fresh air can really help. Um, you know, wake you up and make you feel a bit better. And you can also use them for um, you know planting you know pot plants on your balcony or maybe um, plants that hang over the edge of the balcony as well. So they will also can also benefit people who are walking past because if you're walking past buildings where there's lots of hanging baskets, lots of greenery along the wall, that can create a more pleasant environment to walk around rather than just a blank facade with windows on. Yeah. That makes sense. I do appreciate it when I walk past um, windows or balconies that have been well decorated. Uh, with yeah. Foliage. It's good. Yeah. I mean, you kind of feel like you kind of admire them and envy them at the same time. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I'm with you. Um, <laughs> as I say, I'm not very good at keeping plants alive, apart from this one you can see just over my shoulder. Um, <laughs> cactus. Cactus is the way forward. Um, I haven't killed one yet, but <laughs> I do kill a house plant. There is an emotional investment there, so oh, yeah, absolutely. Is it is it worth the investment if you know you're going to kill it? <laughs> <laughs> um, someone is asking, what's your favourite tree? Oh, probably willow trees. Um, I grew up in a little village, and just out opposite our house, there's the village green, which is covered in willow trees. Um, so they're always really fun. You could climb them, make swings on them, and they just kind of always look really beautiful and sad. Um, and they remind me of home. So. Okay. Like, oh, you know, well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good choice, good choice. <laughs> um, are there any opportunities for citizen science contributions to help map green space or use space? Um, 
there may be some citizen science opportunities coming up soon to help us maybe with our sensor project. And we're also looking at, although this is really early stages, potentially doing something with an app um, to look at green space and people's relationship with green space. Um, so hopefully, uh, yeah, I'll keep you posted. Excellent. If you get any information about that, we'd be happy to share it as well for you. So um, oh, no, thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, do you have any good nature documentary recommendations? Ooh. I mean, I'm a huge David Attenborough fan. Just watch anything David Attenborough, um, basically. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else that's particularly... Um, yeah, I think in general, anything David Attenborough um, is really good. Good choice. I mean, there's quite the vast array there. He's done quite a few at this point. so <laughs> Yeah, but something like Planet Earth, is going to give you a really good overview of actually actually yeah planet earth probably is one of the best ones because it kind of covers all these really interesting habitats and it's got amazing scenery and um, rather than something like blue planet which is also amazing but it's kind of pretty much underwater and um, which isn't like i mean i'm sure it's great but i'm a big fan of the like big views and you know cool caves and stuff like that i was going to say actually if you observe like blue planet underwater footage coral reefs do you think that has any impact yeah, probably. Um, there's less research on blue space, so like any like oceans, rivers, ponds, stuff like that. There's less research on that than on um, green space, but it is has shown to be like exposure to blue space. Still, kind of, I think because it helps you connect with nature, and often water can be really peaceful. So if you think about a park that's got a water fountain, it will sound nice and drown out background noise. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> unless you're going to the park to listen to bird song in which case it's, it's not ideal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um another question coming in um do you consider green space effects in children so positive effects of walks or regular access to green hmm. space have you looked at that specifically hmm. in children it's not something that I focus my research on because the ways in which I measure mental well-being normally are through these um, specifically designed surveys which enable us to look at these different aspects of well-being and they're not designed for use in children but there's a lot of really great research that does. Um, one thing that's really interesting is kids that um, experience things like ADHD um, they can benefit a lot particularly from exposure to green space. I think it's, you know, it's a real energy release. Um, and also uh, exposure to nature in children is really good for resilience building. Um, they learn to evaluate risk um, in a kind of safe way, because, I mean, they're not going to do loads of damage if they fall out of a tree, really, you know, particularly for keeping a close eye on them. It's a really good for them learning their physical boundaries um, and what they're capable of and evaluating risk. And when kids are playing in green spaces as well, if you're playing a computer game, say, um, it's the kid that's the best at smashing buttons that's going to lead the game. Whereas if you're out in nature, it tends to be the kid that's the most creative because they'll create the best adventure. So it's really good for like a whole variety of things. It's just not something that I've specifically researched, but I've read a lot about it. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, I suppose it depends on the size of the tree that your child is falling out of, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Getting a little insight into your tree climbing ability, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone is just asking, does this, so is this specifically for green space, the environment itself, or does it extend to include sort of animals? So is there a positive effect of watching animal documentaries or having pets, do you know? Oh, well, having pets um, can be, yeah, a huge emotional support. Um, but I think we all know, you know, how much, particularly like how much our dogs and cats are, well, dogs are loving having us at home. Cats are highly disapproving of the fact that we're in their space so much of the time at the moment. Um, but I think, yeah, it's like really, it brings that connection to nature and that other form of life. It also kind of can help you give you a little bit of purpose because you're hopefully, you know, caring for this animal, building a relationship with them. And it's really important. And Particularly for children, it can be really good for like exposure to a good, like a normal amount of bacteria is really good, like for their general health. And also teaching them about life cycles as well. It can be a fairly, um, you know, a good way of introducing, um, you know, the concept of death and things like that, which is a bit morbid, but, you know, it's a, a important thing to learn. <laughs> That is true, yeah. That's actually, um, someone just commented on that about the bacteria. Um, yeah. Getting, sort of getting muddy and dirty as a child can help build up your immune system to certain things, um, which I guess a lot of 
kids are probably missing out on at the moment if they don't have any access to green space. Um, yeah. But hopefully this virus will go soon and we can all be back out there rolling around. Fingers <laughs> <Good around. laughs> um, What changes do you want to see um, in terms of green spaces um, and how we use them after the lockdown ends? I think I think there's a lot of green space that's pretty exclusive that should be opened up more widely. So I know for some reason Gosforth has about twenty go I mean, it has like three golf courses. But that's a lot for like a, a small area of the town, right? Um and like things like the the race course, which aren't you know, at the when there's not a race day, that should be open to the public for people to walk around. And I know I sometimes see people walking around there, but I'm not sure whether you're meant to. But it feels like there's a lot of space that we're not necessarily able to fully utilize that could be open um, to the public. Um, and I think I think perhaps the community should be more involved in their green space if and when they want to be, maybe take a bit more ownership of it and um, specify how they want their green spaces to be used or what events they want to be on or whether they think there's changes that they would make as well, I think is really important. Mm. I suppose this relates, have you heard some of the plans for um, Newcastle in particular, the plans to open up uh, Grey Street, make it more pedestrian? Oh, yeah. yeah. And one of their ideas is to remove um, some of their parking that's down there and open up little, what they're calling pocket parks, yeah. so little green spaces in the parking spaces. Do you think we'll be able to see a major benefit from that? Uh, hopefully. Because actually, um, and this is something that I've kind of fallen into with my research as well, is that we look at where the people live and where the green space is. But particularly for people who work full time during the week, the green space closer to where you work and spend your time is actually way more important during the working week. And particularly in the winter when you only get time outdoors at home at the weekends. So yeah, bringing more green space into the city centre. I mean, we're lucky at the university, we've got Lisa's Park and Exhibition Park right there. Um, which is really, really good. I tend to try and do like a quick lap of the lake in Lisa's Park on my lunch break. Um, but I think, yeah, bringing a bit more into the city centre because it is fairly, I mean, it's Grey Street. And it, I'm trying not to say it's grey because it's Grey Street, but it's grey. <laughs> <laughs> I understand what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite lucky in that my um, office looked out over um, Exhibition Park, which oh, is... Wow. Um, I assume there's a lot for my mental well-being, but it also yeah. looks out directly onto an ice cream van, so it's not done that well for my physical health. Oh, no, <laughs> I, I would say that. ice cream is ice cream is definitely an emotional support food. Uh, probably <laughs> not the quantity I'm. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> Um, so we've got another question here asking, uh, bearing in mind your research, in cities, should we be spending time, money, effort on artificial green spaces like roof gardens or garden bridges, or would we be better off protecting natural urban green spaces, do you think? I think it depends what you mean by artificial green spaces, because if you're going to, you know, astroturf everything, yeah probably don't do that. That's also really, really bad for flooding um, because you need that kind of layer of soil in the grass to like, absorb the rainwater and help it filter off gently. Um, so obviously more natural spaces are going to have, you know, potentially more biodiversity, they're potentially more mental health benefits. Um, but anywhere I think you can bring greenery into the city. So if you're thinking of roof gardens as not fake plants, but they're not necessarily a natural place for greenery to grow, I think that's great because it's going to, people will be able to see it, people will be able to use it. And I think that's really, I think anything you can do to make it, make things greener. And even, I mean, there's less research on like artificial plants and whether they can still benefit your mental health. But if they look pretty convincing and you look at them a lot, then I don't see why they wouldn't, although they're not gonna, you know, smell nice and you're not gonna get the satisfaction of keeping them alive. Although you're not gonna feel sad when you kill them because you can't, so. <laughs> Just that. <laughs> I suppose um, from a, a personal perspective, I think even something artificial probably would help. Um, I know in recent years down Northumberland Street in Newcastle, they've started putting down fake um, grass down the middle of the street, mm. which is normally just like paving slabs um, and benches there and stuff. And I really like that. I think it looks better. I think it looks nicer. Um, I, 
I personally do. I, I assumed other people did as well because they have they've kept bringing it back. Um, I think in Newcastle we're very lucky as well. They do a lot of um, active planting. They change up the flower arrangements mm. all around the city. Um, I know this um, quite in depth as well. So I work with honeybees at the university. We have beehives on the roof um, of our building in the centre of campus. And um, every time they change the flower arrangements in the city, the bees bring back different coloured pollen. So I see it in real time as the arrangements have changed. So it's certainly it's great for bee health. Um, yeah. So the flowers are good for our health as well. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, also there's some research to show one of my colleagues at Warwick who is actually looking at biodiversity and actually sometimes those um, changing up the planting can actually be better for biodiversity. Um, even if you're doing it kind of artificially, it's still, you know, changes that the plants are available. So it's like biodiversity over a period of time rather than like a cross-sectional look at biodiversity. But yeah, it can be really helpful. Yeah, I suppose it's refreshing as well. I did wonder when you mentioned the, the two hour limit that um, two hours is sort of optimum. Anything mm. over than that, you don't see much more benefit. I wonder if it is something to do with um, just kind of like a boredom, like a desensitization. You stop noticing everything after two hours, maybe. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. And also, if you're going on a long walk, you're probably pretty tired after a couple of hours anyway. That's true. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> um, Great. Well, I think that is all the questions that we've received. Um, so I find that I'd like to thank you very much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, everyone seemed to enjoy it from the, the chat that I can see. So that's great. So thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's actually, yeah, it's been great and a lot less effort trying to get the Metro home at nine o'clock at night. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, you're already there. So that's fine. Um, and if you have any updates, then please obviously let us know um, or anything about citizen science projects and we can share that through Palace of Science. So that's great. So thank great. you. Cool. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> great. Right. Um, just before we leave, um, I just to thank every, everyone that's watching out there. I have no idea how many of you there are, but thanks for watching along. Um, obviously, if you want to know anything more about Palace of Science and what we do, you probably already know, but we have uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. We have a web page um, and we now have a uh, YouTube channel as well. So you can hopefully hopefully watch this um, talk again if you want to and last month's talk as well. Um, also, if you want to know more about the sort of events that we host, we have a really great blog page on our website. It covers um, blogs people have written about our past events. Um, and at the moment, we've had quite a lot of guest bloggers um, that are posting from uh, scientists and artists as well about how the current situation has affected their work um, and what they're doing at the moment, which has been really interesting. And finally, um, if you enjoyed tonight, we are doing another sidebar next month. So our next sidebar is on Wednesday, the 24th of June. Um, obviously, if we can hold this event in person, we will. But I think it's probably best at the moment to prepare for another online viewing. So it'll probably be through Twitch again. Um, we have another really excellent researcher from Newcastle University, Dr. Paula, Paula Salgado. Um, again, I didn't know um, this was going to be held during a global pandemic, um, but she is going to be discussing um, another increasingly prevalent microscopic threat to human health at hospitals for a bit of refreshing change. It's uh, not a virus, it is antimicrobial resistance, um, talking about superbugs. So um, if you're really enjoying the apocalyptic um, theme of the world, um, then you can hear a bit more about it next month on the 24th of June. Um, so I think that's everything from me. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thanks again to our speaker. And, and hopefully we'll see you again next month. See you later. Bye.